right, everybody, welcome to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. And today we've got Rob Sumsky and some other guests, and we're going to talk about what's going on in the operator framework world. Um, that's OLM and SDK and lots of other good bits. So, Rob, I'm going to let you introduce yourself, talk it for as long as you need, and then we'll have live Q&A and a conversation afterwards. So take it away, Rob. All right, sounds good. Hey, everybody, I'm Rob Sumsky. Um, I'm a PM for OpenShift, um, and I've been looking after the operator framework uh, since it was announced as part of CoreOS um, several years ago now. Um, so I'm here to give you guys an update on uh, some exciting news, uh, what's going on uh, technology-wise, um, feature-wise, and when you can expect certain things. Um, so we'll jump right on into it. Um, the first uh, big news is um, I think we've got enough votes, uh, and I don't think it's official yet, but um, the operator framework is going to be joining the CNCF as an incubating project. Um, um, this includes both the SDK and the lifecycle manager. Um, and so we're going to break down what each of those are and why they're important. Uh, but we're super excited this kind of builds on all the momentum and open source work that we've been doing. Um, being part of the CNCF will be um, hopefully a big win for the project, get uh, more users, uh, more contributors, um, solidify this as the framework for managing operators um, across the Kube ecosystem, so we're super excited about that. Um, so thanks to everybody that um, either commented or voted um, and was involved in this process. It was uh, took a little bit longer than we thought, but that's always the case with these things. Um, so yeah, we're excited about that, and so that's the, the first big news. Um, let's go jump in really quick, but I just always want to start with what is an operator, just in case you're watching this stream and you don't, uh, you're not as familiar with this. Um, and so, at a core, really, an operator um, is a piece of technology that sits in the middle between um, users and a cluster, and it runs software. Um, so, in this uh, example here, you can see the operators in the middle, and what the operator is doing is it deeply understands both knowledge on how to run a type of application. Um, so like a MySQL database or a distributed system, uh, a Kafka um, cluster, whatever it is. Um, so picture all the operational uh, knowledge needed to install that, to upgrade it, to scale it, to monitor it, to back it up, um, whatever it needs to do uh, for that specific application. You build that into a piece of software that then uh, outputs Kubernetes on the other side of it. Um, so uh, making all of the objects that need to happen, wiring them all up, um, generating secrets, storing those in, in uh, the secrets in Kubernetes, um, managing the RBAC, knowing how to upgrade certain parts of the components in the correct order, um, using staple sets when they need to be uh, storing staple data, using deployments when they're stateless, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is what the operator does. Um, and so the operator framework is here to manage all of that, to help you build this piece of software but then help you manage it and upgrade it over time, which is a really important part of it. And what we want to get to is uh, a cloud-like experience. So, um, you know, picture getting your favorite database or machine learning service from a cloud provider. Um, but we want that to work against Kubernetes anywhere that it's running. Um, so the operator is the key there. It's providing that cloud-like experience, but then interfacing with Kube so you get this hybrid cloud experience at the same time. Um, so that's what we're, all, we're going after. Um, so let's dig in a little bit further. Um, so we see operators kind of taking off across every different kind of vertical you can have in software. Um, because you want that SaaS experience and all of these categories that you see on the screen here are just uh, getting more complicated as software gets more complicated. Um, you know, before you might have just run a single MySQL or a single uh, Postgres in a VM against a local disk and you backed it up every once in a while and maybe to a tape library and that was it. Now we've got NoSQL databases, we've got um, all these big data stacks where you're scaling out different parts of the application related to load and how much you're storing. Uh, monitoring solutions that need to react as containers are coming and going in milliseconds. And so um, the throughput there is really high and also the um, how dynamic the system in is, is very high. And so you need different ways of uh, running that type of software to, to you know, keep up with uh, Kubernetes in this modern software. Um, you know, messaging services are super popular in financial services and um, all these different systems that need to talk to each other. And so those become critical. Can you scale those? Can you monitor them? Do you know what's going on? Are you setting them up in the most secure way? All that really matters. Um, and then uh, lastly, I think storage is a really interesting one because if you think about it, uh, we don't want to be tied to a single local disk anymore. But in our Kube clusters, we actually have tons of local disks. As you have 100 nodes, you've got 100 or more disks. Um, so what uh, some of these storage providers do is 
splice up those disks into network addressable storage um, that the kube cluster understands through its PV and PVC um, mechanisms. And so you kind of run storage on the cluster for the cluster, which is really exciting. Um, and that's a whole distributed system too. Uh, Ceph, Gluster, a bunch of other technologies are used there as well. So that's where operators play. Um, I'm not going to throw up the, the logos of any of these, but um, every major vendor, I think, in all of these categories has an operator at this point. Um, so uh, take a look out. Um, our place for discovering those is operatorhub.io. Um, this is a listing of a bunch of open source and community operators. Um, Red Hat also certifies operators, and so you can find those inside of your OpenShift cluster as well, alongside all those community offerings and Red Hat products. Um, so breaking down what the operator framework is, it's really um, these three main pieces. Um, the operator SDK for building operators. Um, so this is a new style of building software, um, you know, interacting with Kubernetes APIs and how to best do that, as well as um, hooking up a distributed system into, um, you know, operational knowledge embedded in code. And so what the SDK allows you to do is start with a bunch of scaffolding for code where you just have to bring the knowledge of your application. If you're a, a Postgres admin, you kind of know how to administer Postgres. So we're going to help you um, express that in either Go code, Ansible code, or in a Helm chart. Um, and so that's how we help you build an operator. And so we'll talk about some of the new features coming in these SDKs, but they're pretty robust right now. Um, and we've got a ton of folks that are building really interesting things with them. Next is the lifecycle manager. This is the thing that helps you once you've built this operator and it's you know it's packaged up. How to um, get it out to all your customers? How do a hundred different people um, go install this on their kube clusters? How do they manage it? How do they make sure that all the correct permissions and security is set up correctly? Um, the lifecycle manager helps you do this. And then I already mentioned Operator Hub IO for um, discovering operators that have been published by uh, different authors out there on the internet. Um, so I talked about the SDK and um, how we have these three different flavors of it. There's Helm, Ansible, and Go. Um, there are also other open source uh, frameworks for creating operators out of Java and some other things like that. Um, so if you're interested in your favorite language, um, there's probably something out there for you and somebody has already started doing that. You can, uh, people have written these and all kinds of things. Um, so uh, a different part of the SDK than just dealing with writing code is all of the other important stuff that comes along with it. Um, so how do I package this up so that uh, I can go run it through a CI pipeline? Um, the testing is really key here because if you think about it, this operator is going to be managing really important and really complex distributed systems, and that's why you're expressing it in code, but you want to validate that that code is correct. And so um, we have some tools that are built into the SDK, and the operators are instrumented to help you uh, do things like when I um, kill an important part of this, does the operator resurrect it? Or if I go mess with some important configuration variables that I, uh, you know, I need to ensure remain in place, does the operator go replace those back to what they should be? Um, when I send a, a bunch more requests into my distributed system, does the operator scale up the correct component accordingly? Um, those are all things that uh, you know, we want to express in testing pipelines and so that people can really test um, the code that they're writing, and then your customers can all just depend that, yes, you are orchestrating MySQL and Kafka correctly. Um, so you can check this out. They're on GitHub um, under the operator framework org. Um, and we've got, like I said, these three flavors. Um, you see these arrows that go from left to right. That is um, talking about what we have, uh, we call a maturity model. And the maturity model is just how smart is this operator, basically. Um, and it depends on each application kind of uh, where you need to fall on this, but um, installing and upgrading is kind of, uh, you mentioned on all of them, and that's really the bare minimum. I need to be able to install whatever this application is and then update all the components of whatever the application is installing. Um, so this is, for a, a traditional like scale-out database, this might be you know the MySQL and Postgres uh, processes themselves. Um, any authentication and rate limiting proxies you might have in there. Um, if you have read replicas, um, updating and orchestrating how those are all connected together, all kind of falls into that. And so all of our SDKs help you with that part of your application lifecycle. Now you see the day two operations term mentioned for Ansible and Go. Uh, that refers to all of the other dynamic reconfiguration that you would do um, for any sort of application. So um, in the database example we just talked about, what if you started with a single node and you installed and you could upgrade that and that's awesome, but then your app actually gets started getting Recording really has started.
and you need to go out and, uh, you know, uh, add a read replica tier or, oh, I actually didn't need this to be HA, but now I want it to be HA. Um, all those are day two operations where you can say, hey, operator, just start backing up this thing. Hey, scale it out automatically and have the operator do it. That's all day two. And then you start getting into smarter stuff. Um, so metrics and alerting, orchestrating, uh, monitoring pipelines, doing automatic tuning of the workload based on how it's running um, are all really important. Um, and so that's where you need higher level primitives in the SDK and the, in the language that you're using to express all that logic. Um, and so that's where some of these different, um, different types of code bases can work for you or against you, depending on the type of application that you're running. Um, jumping over to the lifecycle manager. So once you've done all that, you've built your operator and you've written all your code, um, you would think, oh, I just need to run it, right? You just, just go put it on the cluster. Um, well, there's actually a lot of different uh, needs here related to running um, and installing these operators because you've got different personas that are involved. Um, so I've got the, the three kind of main ones here at the top. Um, I've got an operator developer who might be uh, building an operator either internal to your organization or um, is tweaking something about an operator and they have very specific needs where they need to, you know, they want to test against a live cluster and so you've got some things that they can do there, um, especially if you want to register it with a catalog. Um, you've got a cluster admin who is looking after the whole cluster themselves. They're probably not experts in all of the applications that are running on the cluster, but they do want to ensure that um, if there are certain CVEs in some of the software that's running on the, the cluster, that that stuff stays up to date um, and, you know, managing dependencies between some of the teams maybe at a very high level. Um, so you need to update all these operators and get a good sense of uh, how healthy they are, what's going into those updates, um, you know, if there is any security content in there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of the purview of the cluster admin. And then the cluster user um, really just wants to run databases and messaging queues and storage services or whatever it is. Um, so they just needed a mechanism for discovering which operators are installed on the cluster and then interacting with them. You know, hey, uh, give me a, um, a MySQL database and this namespace and call it test. And then I want a different one with a different configuration in prod. Um, and give me some graphs for, you know, all the monitoring that the operator sets up. Um, you know, that's the purview of the actual user there. So when you dig into it at the very bottom here, you see there's um, bubbles for dependency resolution, CRD lifecycle, and collision detection. This is where um, you start to, you know, need a system for installing all these operators because what they're doing is they can depend on each other. So you might have um, a uh, serverless operator that's, uh, you know, running uh, Knative, which is a serverless framework for, you know, writing functions and having an event-driven application. Um, but that actually needs a Kafka queue to, for it to consume its messages. And so it might depend on a Kafka operator. And remember, you as a cluster user don't want to be an expert in either one of those things because you just, you know, want to write your event-driven application. Um, so you install these two operators that actually depend on each other. And so the cluster admin can help manage some of those dependencies for you. Um, and OpenShift has this uh, dependency resolution built in um, based on the lifecycle manager. And then uh, what these use at the core is the CRD, which is a um, custom resource definition. And that is the ability to plug into the Kubernetes um, whole model for um, doing RBAC and extensions to the core. And those need to be lifecycled. So they have uh, versions just like um, a deployment and a staple set and a pod have an API group version in kind. Um, CRDs have the same thing, and so they need to be upgraded and managed as they might go from alpha to beta to stable, um, or as new features in Kubernetes come in, like um, some of the new validation uh, logic that was just shipped, um, where you can say, you know, this is a field as an integer, and I want you to enforce that, um, upgrading into all of those new capabilities as well. And then lastly, you don't want two operators uh, colliding over trying to manage the same type of resource. So if you, you know, if there were two Kafka operators out there, um, you don't want them both trying to operate on the same Kafka uh, cluster. Um, so there's some collision detection that's built into the lifecycle manager. And that's really just to protect the cluster from itself. Um, it really kind of happens all under the hood without you really having to notice it. So that's a quick um, overview of kind of where these two pieces of software sit and why they're so important. And then let's go into some specifics about new stuff that's coming. So in OpenShift 4.5, um, 
we are first introducing a new bundle format for operators. Um, and this, the bundle is really all the metadata that those two systems create in order to install and upgrade and manage operators. Um, so this is really on an operator author um, is the person that's really going to interact with this. And um, the exciting thing about this is it just breaks apart some of the dependencies we had on these manifests um, that you had to build so that um, they're a little bit easier to uh, run. And what's really exciting is they're actually going to be packaged just as containers, just like anything else on the um, on the platform. And so when you build an operator release, um, you know, you'll, you'll have all the kube objects that represent all the our back that this thing requires, and here's the service accounts I want you to create, and here, you know, I can be installed cluster-wide, or I only work in a namespace. All that metadata about how it works um, is bundled up into a container image, and then you can just mirror that into whatever container registry you want. Um, so uh, OpenShift will have, you know, some bigger uh, bundles of these um, operators, you know, that represent our certified and our community operators, but you can also just build, you know, your own and distribute them. Um, so one of our um, partners might want to do that, for example. And so all you do is you pull this container and you say, you register it in the cluster and say, hey, this is a new operator that I want to use. It's represented by this container image. Um, make it available on my cluster and it goes. You can see this new operator object on the right hand side makes that happen. Um, we're also going to be using this new format on Operator Hub and kind of build it into all the tools. So the SDK, you know, builds these things. Olin knows how to run it, et cetera. So that's really exciting. It's kind of more under the hood, but it, it matters if, if you uh, are building an operator. Um, the next is um, new capabilities inside of our package manager tool, OPM. Um, to start building customized versions of all of these. So instead of just, you know, a one-off operator ships version one and then version two, um, you at a big bank or insurance company or something like that um, might want to curate your own set of catalogs. These are the operators that we have tested and we know are high quality and work well. Um, so I want to, you know, allow folks to have access to these. Um, we have a new tool called OPM that can uh, help you build and uh, push those to a central place. Um, so you can say, instead of registering operators one by one, here is my entire private catalog of operators uh, that I want to use in my cluster. This is really important for clusters that are in disconnected environments. So um, sometimes uh, government agencies and financial services, you know, things that are running like a stock exchange, um, aren't connected to the internet. And so you want to be able to use operators in that environment just like any other. Um, and so these catalog can be built. Uh, you can mirror all of the containers that are required into, you know, that specialized environment, and then they can use operators all the same. Um, so we're really excited about that tool. So this is a, a bigger um, uh, feature add for those specific types of customers. Then lastly, um, all these uh, bundle changes are really all about introducing a new operator uh, API. So before, if you were in the, um, the ecosystem and have used some of these before under the hood, um, we have a bunch of different manifest files that kind of describe how this thing works. Um, so the cluster service version, uh, the CSV, is typically the main piece of metadata that we have. Um, and that would describe, you know, all of the, the CRDs that this operator uses um, under the hood and how to install them and the permissions and things like that. But then it was a little bit detached from um, the subscription information, which is how do you upgrade this operator? Does it happen automatically or does it happen manually? Um, and then uh, some other things about how that actually gets installed on the cluster. So we're going to go unify that all into a new operator concept. Um, so this is going to be really exciting because, you know, then you would just say, OC or kubectl get operators instead of having to go look at all these different objects uh, and kind of piece it together yourself. It'll all just be right there. Um, work just like, you know, you would say get pods. Um, you know, you're not going to go hunt around um, to four different objects to try to figure out what's going on with your pod. So we're pretty excited about that. A lot of under the hood changes, um, but it's going to be a big UX win at the end. Um, one of the last uh, big things coming in OpenShift 4.5 is um, a bunch of scaffolding around uh, admission webhooks, or webhooks in general. Um, and uh, this is key because if you're uh, familiar with the kube extension mechanisms, you can actually plug into a bunch of the deep parts for like when every single object is created in Kubernetes. You can um, have a yay or nay on whether that object gets created, and that's called an admission webhook. And um, these webhooks are really key to doing advanced functionality because um, you might want to block um, every Postgres CRD, so this a custom object that an operator uses, that doesn't have um, two different required pieces of um, 
settings in there. You might want to say, hey, go reject that, and somebody needs to go resubmit that with the valid settings. And this might not just be that you know both of those exist, but the values of them can be compared with custom logic so that you know that it is actually truly valid. Um, an example of this is uh, Jetstack's really popular cert manager um, for doing uh, Let's Encrypt certificates for um, PKI. Um, validate some of the settings against other things that you um, pass in so that it knows that you're going to get a valid cert out and that your environment and the settings that you're passing in are actually able to create a certificate that they can uh, issue. Uh, so that's really exciting. Um, so we, what we do is we scaffold all these webhooks, and if you have to imagine, you know, these have to have TLS and they're secured, um, and they're sitting in the, the critical path of Kube operating, because it's going to ask for every object, you know, it's listening for, hey, go send off to this webhook and give it a yay or nay. Um, if the webhook is down, you're not making any objects because it can't make a yay or a nay decision. Um, and so what we do is we use the platform uh, OLM and uh, OpenShift to scaffold all of that for you. So we rotate your TLS certificates. We generate them in the first place. We set up all the routes and ingress for it to work. We run the pod that runs the webhook and all that type of stuff. Um, so really, really easy. All you do is write your logic for the webhook itself. Um, mutating uh, webhooks work the same way. You're basically um, mutating things instead of blocking admission of them. Um, so if you wanted to um, set a parameter on every single object um, that goes to the system for like auditing or you know all kinds of uh, things like that, you can do that. Um, and you can also block mutation if somebody were to enter into a bad state for that operator, just like the settings you wanted to block on create. You can also do that on edit. Um, so a good example of this is kubedb is an operator that helps you run dbs on kube, um, and it actually prevents accidental deletions. Um, so it, it can look at the cluster and, and figure out if it thinks that you didn't clean up, um, you know, you didn't delete all the objects, you just happened to delete this one critical one. Did you really mean to delete that? Um, or some behaviors that it can power. Um, so that's really exciting. And then the last part of this is going to be um, in later OpenShift releases, which is... Um, the CRDs owned by an operator will be able to do conversion webhooks, which is kind of the last major type of webhook, which is um, when you upgrade a CRD from like an alpha to a beta or a beta to a stable API, uh, you might need to mutate existing CRDs that are already in the cluster for them to, you know, meet that new standard. Um, and so you'll be able to do those uh, in the same manner um, in a successive uh, OpenShift release. All right, so that's all uh, in 4.5. Uh, now I just want to touch a little bit more on the future and what's coming in the next year or so. Um, and uh, one of the things that we've been working on is um, an easier update graph. So if you picture when you're updating from version 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, um, some of those versions might be able to be skipped. Some of them might not. Um, some of them might not work with each other. Um, some of them might have a bug later on that you want to revoke that update. Um, so all the, the typical tools that you would use to like run a SAS or um, to you know manage packages on a system, uh, we're bringing into OLM. And so we have a lot of that today. Uh, but what we don't really have is just an easy way to say, hey, follow just semantic versioning and just kind of make it work, you know, how it should. Um, so you can see some examples here on the left. So if you have auto updates on, um, going from 111 to 112 to 113 just kind of works the way you would think. Um, so those are just uh, make it easier for uh, teams that are building operators to just get things updated. And then for teams that are consuming them, um, you know, admins just to get the updates as they would expect. Um, and then if you did have, um, you know, automatic updates on, it works. If you want to have a manual approval, you know, this thing would wait for you to say, yes, I want to update to that version. So you've got both flows that you can unlock. Um, all of this is without building an explicit graph, which is um, a behavior that we had before where you could say this version replaces that version and then, you know, the next version out would replace that one, et cetera, et cetera. So that's exciting. That's going to be coming soon. We're laying some of the, the scaffolding for that today. Um, on the SDK side, um, we've been integrating uh, for several months now with an upstream project in Kubernetes called Kube Builder. Um, this is a very low-level framework for building uh, Go-based operators. It's kind of what a lot of the tooling inside of um, Kubernetes itself uses to build operators, or you know, their their controllers, what they um, what manages all of the the lifecycle of components. And so we're integrating with that. We don't want to. Um, you know, have two competing projects for this. It just all makes sense to combine efforts. Um, and so uh, what we've been doing is modifying the way that our code scaffolding works to look very similar to these Kube Builder uh, projects. And we're going to add a little wrapper in there so that you can 
um, adopts KubeBuilder uh, projects, but then gain all of the stuff that our SDK adds around it. So if you think of KubeBuilder as just, it's literally just some code and some scaffolding, but you don't get the functional testing and all of the packaging, um, our CLI for doing um, all of the different workflows you need, a better user experience. Um, that's what you'll get from using the SDK, even though the bits un under the hood are some of that same uh, Kube Builder goodness. So this also aligns us with the upstream uh, group, and you know we can all work together towards a common goal. So we're really excited about that. We're you know pretty close to this, um, and uh, you'll see that coming for the first 1.0 of the operator SDK. Uh, next, I've talked about testing a few times. Um, we're, we're moving to um, embrace another uh, open source project called Cuttle, K-U-T-T-L, um, for our scorecard uh, test. So our scorecard is a way to um, both do validating and functional testing of an operator. Um, and Cuddle has a, a really powerful way of doing assertion-based testing. Um, so, you know, you install a version of the operator and, you know, you change, um, say, say you start three replicas and it'll go make sure that you have three pods running or whatever needs to be running. Then if you change that to four, did it actually change to four, et cetera. Um, so you can test out um, in a fairly uh, light touch way your operator's um, behavior. And so we're gonna integrate this into the SDK and we hope this will make um, for a lot more mature operators and so that folks can then uh, you know, even test these on their own if you are at one of these big organizations and you do extensive validation of software before it gets in your environment, um, you can use these tests to validate it, that it works exactly correctly in your environment as well. Um, this is important as some operators, uh, you know, may call out to hosted services, um, like a lot of monitoring tools will run an agent on your cluster, but then go talk to um, one of their SaaS services. And if you're in a disconnected environment, that might not work. So some of these testing tools can help you uh, tease some of that stuff out. So we're pretty excited about that and uh, working with that team as well. Um, so just to sum it up, um, this is all the, the new stuff that we were talking about, the CSV list bundles. Uh, this is that new bundle format we were talking about. Um, the sim, simver based upgrade logic, so not having to build this extensive graph. Um, being able to bundle uh, functional tests with your operator. Building catalogs with Kubernetes tooling uh, so that you can register a set of operators onto a cluster at the same time. Um, more integrated packaging, so uh, direct ties between the SDK and OLM, especially around that new bundle format, um, and then bringing KubeBuilder style operators into the framework. And then on the cluster uh, admin side, um, some of uh, more advanced dependency resolution and being able to disable that. Uh, the OPM tool for offline mirroring of all the containers needed for an operator, um, the new operator API, and then webhooks, um, and something we didn't talk about, which is the uh, ability to choose a more fine-grained version of an operator instead of pulling off the latest one of a channel um, you can choose. Uh, so that's all coming, um, and we're pretty excited about that. It kind of meets um, everybody's needs from cluster admins to operator developers to operator users. Um, and so that's basically all of the goodness we have coming um, in roughly the next year-ish. Uh, so you'll have to pay attention to the GitHub um, and mailing lists and all that to uh, stay up to date on that. And we can always do another briefing, of course. Um, and we'd love to have your interaction in those communities. So if you've got uh, new features, you want to see us go in a different direction for something or adopt a use case that you think maybe is not unique to you and that uh, we should address for the entire community, um, we would love to have you on our different community calls, mailing lists, GitHub. Please uh, interact with us. And so that's all I have. I think we're going to take some um, questions and just have some open discussion about the operator framework in general. Yeah, well, thank you, Rob. And that was uh, a, a pretty good tour de force, and there was a lot in that um, packed into that little half an hour. So um, one thing that would be really great, uh, there's a couple of other folks that are on the call here. Um, I know Austin's here. I'm just going to put you on 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 view. There's the, the, the announcement should come shortly around um, the operator framework and incubation status for the CNCF. Uh, the vote went through the day before yesterday, I think. We finally got enough votes to move it over the line and then a whole bunch more came in. So that's great. Huge shout out to the TOC for um, making this happen and working with us and, and getting all of the, jumping through all the hoops was, was actually worth the effort and um, we're really pleased to be there. 
So, um, and Austin is one of the organizers for the SDK working group, so the sub working group of the operator framework. So, just say hi, Austin. Um, and if you wanted to get involved right now, um, where would you, Austin? Where would you send people? Uh, yeah, the best place, the uh, the central hub for where to get in contact with us is the community repo in the operator framework GitHub, and that will point you to the other places, but just to give you a preview of what you might see, um, you'll see uh, three working group meetings, the operator framework meeting, which is uh, the third Tuesday of the month, the operator SDK community meeting, which is monthly on the first Wednesday, and uh, the operator framework OLM working group, which is every two weeks on Thursday. Um, in addition to that, you can join the uh, Operator Framework Google group um, or file issues on our GitHubs. And I'm sure there'll be some more infrastructure and scaffolding created as we move over to the uh, CNCF um, and all of the other SIGs and stuff like that. So watch for some transitioning um, news and information coming out in the, the upcoming days, and we'll probably have another chat about that sometime online as well. So there are a couple of questions, and I thought the, the first one was kind of um, pretty good. All those things that um, you, all the goodness you talked about in 4.5, Rob, um, are those coming in 4.5? And if they are, are they tech preview? Um, and I would add, um, just to clarify, those are things that are in OpenShift. Are they also available for um, other Kubernetes? Sure, yeah, I'll start with that one. So. Um... OLIM works against any kube, and so a lot of the features that we talked about, you know, the SDK runs on your laptop for the most part, and so anything cluster-related is going to be OLIM, and you can use that against any kube. Um, so we do some testing on upstream, and of course it's built into OpenShift, and hopefully with the CNCF adoption, we'll see that get built into other kube distros as well. Um, so uh, you get all that kind of no matter where you're running, uh, depending on which version of OLM you have. Um, so in uh, OpenShift for 4.5, um, the new operator API is going to be, um, it's not GA yet because it's going to be read only. And so you can optionally enable a feature flag to use that new API, um, but it will only be reading. Um, if you want to mutate those objects, you will use the old, um, you know, interacting with a CSV directly or a subscription or install plan. Um, and then if you, uh, you know, over successive releases, we'll have um, kind of the two way binding on those objects and then eventually deprecate the old objects. Um, but that'll happen over a long period of time uh, as we start testing it out. So this is really a preview um, for folks just to check out that new API. Um, we'd love feedback. We'd love um, any of that that you have. Um, so that, uh, yeah, you can treat it more as a tech preview, not a GA um, yet. Yeah. Well, I think maybe because we've been having so many conversations in different working groups about disconnected stuff, um, Waleed's got a, um, a question about... Um, if may, not really a question, but if you could elaborate a little bit more on disconnected restricted environment enhancements and how they can, people can overcome any possible constraints on how operators are built in the first place, assuming internet access. And he's also not quite sure what is that CSV. Sure. So the CSV is a cluster service version, which is just the metadata around an operator. And so it's, um, you know, the operator is a container. So where do I go get that container? How does it need to run? Does it need a special service account? Um, when I do need a service account, what RBAC does that need to have? And so the, the CSV holds all that information, um, just about how to, how to run and manage this thing. So that's what that is. Um, now for disconnected and restricted environments, um, what you need to do is for every mention of an operator's uh, container or containers that it's gonna spawn, so we call those the operands. So if you have a MySQL operator, um, then you would have operand pods of MySQL running um, on your cluster. So you need to um, basically tell that operator, hey, instead of going to get those from Quay or from Docker Hub or from this online registry, I actually need you to go get them from my private disconnected registry over here that's available you know, in my restricted environment. And so that's what all the features are about is um, scaffolding the code of the operator such that um, swapping out those images, you know, that's going to be the same digest, and so you're getting the same container, um, but it needs to come from a different place. And so that's where a lot of the, um, the scaffolding for disconnected is happening, is moving those container images around. Um, inside of the CSV, 
There's a special metadata field for related images, and this is all the operand images that this operator is going to stamp out. Um, we need to know what those are because you can embed them. If you're familiar with Helm charts, you'll see that you know they're basically built as strings, um, and you know sometimes you'll take in a tag. And so if we don't know the exact explicit image, we can't mirror them. We can't iterate every single tag that exists on this uh, this repo. And sometimes there's not even a way to find that out. Um, and so there's a bunch of scaffolding to help you do that. And then that OPM tool um, will help you. So if you say, I want to mirror these five operators, that actually might translate to 40 or 50 different container images um, that actually need to make it into your environment. And so that tool helps you do that. So um, yeah, hopefully. Malid was pointing out that only a few of the operators support disconnected according to some article he's read here in the chat. Yeah, and so that that represents that those folks need to um, embrace that uh, little bit of indirection versus like explicitly calling out a specific operator image is they need to um, support folks mirroring it and then referencing that other image. Sometimes when you have hard-coded references, you know, your hands are kind of tied there. That's what that, uh, that article is most likely about, is a, a listing of which ones are hard-coded and which ones aren't. I'm wondering if that's something, I mean, and this is just me thinking out loud, so apologies, if that's some piece of metadata um, that we could put on operatorhub.io um, to show whether something supported um, disconnected or not. Um, exactly. That might be. Yeah, something. so that's something that we're, we're looking to do um, for both Operator Hub and inside of OpenShift itself, is when you have that related images section filled out, we can reasonably assume that this operator has been tested in a disconnected environment. Um, and so uh, hopefully over time as more operators are embracing this is that we can then, you know, maybe put that in our certification pipeline is actually checking, you know, that this does work in a disconnected environment, that kind of thing. And, and Ryan was noting also that um, in a related update that um, from Minikube, which all of us know and, and loved and um, wish there was a mini shift, um, that OLM is available as a, a plugin now. Um, to many oh, sweet, that's awesome. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Let's see and so, we... yeah, having OLM uh, accessible to you as a, a developer, is, uh, as an operator developer, is interesting because that's how you can start testing all those upgrade paths yourself. Um, so, and, you know, test that somebody can go from a single node of your application to a multi-node version of it to maybe test out backup and restores and that they can, you know, restore to a disaster recovery environment. All that stuff can be orchestrated um, locally as well. So that's important. Yeah. So um, I'm not going to ask you the question I think that everybody wants to know is really is when is 4.5 actually coming out the door? Um, and there's like, yeah, we all get shot for that, um, saying any dates and time. But it should be all of what we're talking about here should be available in the not too distant future. Um, and because it's all in timing. And then in 4.6, which is OpenShift 4.6, um, I, what are the, the the key things that we can look to get in four six of those the next next round of things? Yeah, um, the the main things for that are going to be getting that operator API um, into a, a read and write mode, um, and so the, we'll kind of have both of those living side by side in four six, and then some more extensive um, dependency management. And so this is something that we've been exploring as operators are starting to get more intertwined as um, people are building products that, you know, you have your application and you need a database or you need, you know, like a Kafka for that event stream like we were talking about. Um, but you might want to depend not just on the latest version of a Kafka operator, but maybe a very specific version or a range of versions, or it's an optional dependency, not a required dependency. Um, so bringing all of that type of fidelity to the dependency management is something that we're going to be exploring in 4.6 and beyond. Um, you know, it's not an overnight thing, um, but you know, getting new features in 4.6 and some in 4.7 and some in 4.8, et cetera. So, and we have uh, a number of SDKs already. Are there any, I mean, we've talked about Python SDKs, other SDKs, are there any other SDKs um, in the works at the moment? Um, is there anything that from Austin or others that that we're looking at um, building out because we always talk about Helm and Ansible and Go and now the Kube Builder stuff and that why do we uh, maybe how do we get more languages and more approaches um, into this into this mix or are there plans for that? Austin, you want to take this one? 
Uh, sure. Um, so the Helm and the Ansible operators are not, they're a language of themselves, but um, they are actually under the hood, they are Go operators as well. And so you can kind of think of them as more like a shim operator that allows operators in those respective languages. Um, and if you wanted something in Python or any other language, it's going to be it's going to require the creation of controller runtime in that language. So um, we're not there yet. It's something that we're still considering, and it gets brought up every now and then, but we're not actively working on it yet. It usually gets brought up by me. Um, but that's that's usually something that, that comes in from the Python community. Um, yeah. so that's, oh, that's what I was going to say. Is, is Python is probably one of the ones. Um, but and if you think about it, developers that are building against a stack know their stack. So if you run, um, if you're a, a big investment bank or something, and you write Python, you probably want to build an operator in Python. It makes sense, you know. Um, so that's where folks are kind of demanding that that wide swath of stuff. Um, and so, and there's like a Java framework that's outside of our SDK that people use to build operators in Java and that kind of thing. Yeah. So it looked like Joe hey, was Joe. waving his hand. Yeah. Did he, something to add yeah, to that? Yeah, I add to that and say that um, if anyone is interested in helping contribute uh, to to develop some of those uh, underlying libraries that are so critical to to having um, making it easy to develop the right primitives for operators, we're definitely interested in collaborating. So. If you're out there and, you're, and you've got a Python operator and you've written a lot of these primitives, definitely hit us up and let us know. I think probably one of the big hurdles is just having the expertise in those languages and knowing how to basically duplicate the equivalent of a scaffolding tool that can um, lay down files for a project in your language and then also have the underlying libraries that make it really easy to basically give developers a reconciled method to implement. So I think the kind of the first thing that we're looking for is those kind of two building blocks. And that's what's holding us back really at this point. So yeah, if anyone's interested in, in helping us do that, by all means, let us know. Yeah, I think that part part of what my hope is with the um, the CNCF um, incubation project that we'll get more visibility and get more um, get more resources and, and experts to help us. Um, build out some of the other pieces that um, will be helpful to, to continue to grow the adoption of operators um, and, and others. You mentioned, um, Rob, also the, uh, the certified program for operators. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how people get involved in that or bring their, bring their wares to the operator certification that Red Hat has. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So those are the, the two main uh, flavors of operators. We have uh, community listing at Operator Hub IO. And then we have um, vendors that are building commercially supported operators or building operators around their commercially supported software. And uh, they want a way to kind of get like the stamp of approval from Red Hat that this software uh, works well and integrates well with OpenShift. And so that's our certification program. Um, and basically you can take your, your same code base and we run it through, a, a you know, some testing and um, we want to make sure that we can jointly support customers is a big part of this program. Um, so it's not just technical, it's that we have um, agreements in place for how we can both um, support customer tickets and, and escalations and bugs and things like that in a, you know, a reasonable time frame. So that's all about that kind of that wrapped up into that program. Um, we have a, a web page. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head, but um, if you search for Red Hat Operator Certification, you'll find it. Um, and that's where you can go and get in touch with some of our engineers, um, and we can start looking at your operator and make sure um, that it, it works well, get it through our testing pipeline, and do some of the other you know business side of things to uh, get that certification to happen. Um, then we've got like probably over 100 now, I think, certified, so it's a well-oiled machine. Um, and, you know, across all the categories that we talked about, we've got storage vendors, we've got all the major databases, um, we've got a bunch of machine learning stuff and some monitoring services and all kinds of things. So we'd love to have your product uh, listed yeah. there as well. Yeah, and, you know, this is from the community side of things. If you go to operatorhub.io, there's a whole um, set of documentation in there um, to step you through if you have an operator, how to get it in there. And um, there's also 
the I think the interesting thing about the hubs and that is that they're really kind of based on a catalog and what you could resurface and rebuild your own operator hub or whatever using the um, the underpinnings as well and and that is out there in the open source land as well so um, for those of you who are standing up your own operator hubs um, there there is a way there's a an easy way for you to do that as well so um, interesting to see see that I think there's about just under 140 community operators in operatorhub.io at the moment, and um, it's a pretty, pretty interesting group of um, folks who have come in, not not quite randomly, but um, and a lot of them are done in conjunction with this. They do a certified operator, and they also put one in the community as well. So it's a it's a it's a pretty easy yeah. onboarding process in in both ways. As, as so, we we hope that if you are building an operator that you will come and um, also offer something up in the operatorhub.io and um, make it available to that. Um, let's see. What is the advice for enterprise workloads? Um, should we stick to 4.3? I don't know. That sounds like it's a beyond the scope of an operator conversation. That's a big conversation, 4.3. We, we can touch on it All really right. quick if you want. Um, so. Just uh, understand that in OpenShift, uh, we have um, a new model where we're doing these over-the-air upgrades with OpenShift 4, and that's to keep you um, kind of up-to-date with Kubernetes as it's changing, as it's being updated for uh, new features, bugs, security enhancements, et cetera. Um, and so we encourage folks to upgrade um, often, as often as we release. Um, so, uh, you know, getting from 4.3 to 4.4 to 4.5 is really important for staying on top of the, the you know, security of your cluster. Um, and remember, that's the version of the operating system as well, is all being managed with that version. Um, and the guarantee in all of our API versioning is that we will not break your workloads. And that's including over that upgrade. Um, you should not experience downtime for your applications. And if you do, that's a bug and we want to fix it. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have these tools in place to do these over-the-air upgrades so that when you're managing a fleet of clusters, it's not any harder to manage one cluster as it is 100. Um, and so hopefully, you know, you don't have too many excuses to not go from version to version to version. Um, you can also skip versions if you want and migrate your applications as well. Um, but all of the workloads that we have, um, you know, we're guaranteeing to not break that compatibility with the, the Kube API version, so the group version in kind. Um, looks like Waleed wants to be unmuted. Yes, I've done that. So, Waleed, speak up. You may have to unmute yourself. Uh, hi. I am asking this question because, for example, when you talk about uh, vendor operators like uh, Portworx, NSX from VMware, they are certified on a certain release, and most of them they certify on 4.3. And some of Red Hat consultants give us this uh, advice that they say, Stay on the stable 4.3 latest, GA. Don't move to 4.4. And actually, that's what I'm trying to do today. I'm trying to downgrade to 4.3. But I'm, I'm wondering if this is like a good trusted advice, or as you say, that we should move forward, but then I will be missing out on the quality uh, insurance that the vendor testing uh, does, basically. I know, for example, VMware, they haven't tested 4.4 with their NSX operator, which should be out. So what yeah. do you think, Rob? So, um, I mean, always, like, if, if uh, Portworx or VMware or whatever is a hard dependency on you, of course, listen to the, the guidance of, of where that's supported. Um, but w I know we're, we're constantly talking to both of those vendors on um, getting them testing the latest versions um, as soon as possible and certifying those on their side as fast as possible. Um, and so we want everybody to kind of move forward together. Um, so, you know, that we stay up to date with all the um, the work going on in Kube, the feature set going on in OpenShift, and then the features inside of their product as well, and keeping that all moving uh, in quick succession. Um, and so, yeah, it's a um, – sometimes this is a new model for some of those vendors, and so we're working with them. Um, so I would continue uh, for you to work with them as well and try to, um, you know, get them into this kind of uh, more cloud-like experience of consuming software versus, you know, set it and forget it kind of thing. Just to point out, the the more you ask for it, the more they'll listen. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And I also think that every, everybody recognizes the complexity of the ecosystem that we're in at the moment. Um, the interdependencies of Kubernetes operators um, brings more to the, the table, open shift release cycles. Uh, you know, this is, this is a very complex world and we are, you know, we're, we're all in conversations constantly with the partners, with the upstream folks um, and trying, you know, that's, that's part, I'm not gonna keep going back, that's part of the wonderful part about being included in the, uh, the, the CNCF um, incubation process is hopefully we'll get more visibility of what the other pieces and parts of the universe of um, cloud native um, ecosystem looks like and can have more conversations with these other folks. Not that like with KubeBuilder and um, was, was it Cuddle? The tech meme, there are a lot of these conversations that have already been going on with Helm 3 and lots of other folks um, in the background. But I think this just, you know, this is one of the complexities of such a big ecosystem um, is, is managing all those relationships. And, um, you know, we, the more we can do it out in the open and the more we can do it um, transparently with lots of sunlight on it and lots of eyeballs on it, um, the easier it'll be. And I think, you know, Portworx and the other folks that you mentioned, Waleed, they're all, they're all in this community with us together and we're all learning um, together. So um, it's getting alignment at, with release cycles, feature sets. The more we talk about it, the better off we all are. So yeah, touch, touch base with your, your, operator vendor partners and you know there I know there are those ones that you mentioned are definitely in conversations with us quite a bit so hopefully we can get there so um I'm wondering if there's any questions let's see there's a couple more chat things here coming in um Dan is asking is there a roadmap for the Red Hat operators that will be released to the operator hub i.e will there be Advanced cluster management. Well, that was yesterday's topic. No, but we'll, we'll let Rob answer that one. Um, I don't know if there's a specific roadmap. It's kind of up to each team. Um, I know that the um, ACM, the Advanced Cluster Management team, does have an open source uh, version as is classic with Red Hat. Um, I don't know if they've packaged that. Uh, since you're asking the question, I'm going to go ahead and assume no. Um, so I, I can't comment on what that team is going to do there, but we want that team to have ownership over um, that the packaging and management of that operator, just like we want any of the other open source projects to do that. Um, so I, I can't comment on their roadmap, but I hope they list it. Um, I would love to see that. Yeah, no, that would be great. And I know we, we've had an ACM talk yesterday. We'll have a few more talks, so you'll have opportunities to nudge them in, in that direction um, as well. So um, stay tuned and we'll let us know. Are there other operators um, that people um, who are on this call that are missing or that we that you're looking for besides ACM? I think ACM is top of brain for everybody. Yes, there is one, I ha someone's asking, the ACM recording from yesterday has not been uploaded to YouTube, but if you look on the Twitch stream, the uh, raw one is available on Twitch. Um, unfortunately for the ACM one yesterday, the demo went south. The demo gods were not with them. So um, we will be redoing that again, and there's another one um, next week. So um, Willie said the most important one to them is the Open Data Hub one. Is there one for Open Data Hub yet? Um, I, thought, well, I thought, well, maybe was... there's not, actually. I thought there was. Um... I don't think so yet. Um... Yeah, I know we have we done anything commons wise with Open Data Hub, right? Like I looked earlier and I couldn't find anything. Diane, did you do yeah. one earlier this year? Well, we've done lots of briefings. I'm like, I don't think there could be an operator for Open Data Hub. Open Data Hub is a thing. He, yeah, Bird did a great demo yeah. of that, but I don't like. Oh, and I. And actually, this is a good segue. We're having an AMA in a couple of weeks on a Monday, if you look at the calendar, with the Open Data Hub team um, uh, at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Um, and I'll look up the calendar in a second. Um, but you can ask them that. But Open Data Hub, per se, is not, um, is not something that is a, would be a single operator that you would, in, in my thinking of the way that we look at Operator Hub, um, Open Data Hub has lots of components to it, um, and it's more of a reference architecture than a single operator. But yeah, that's that's where we're at with that. 
So um, maybe, uh, Rob, if you could just take a moment and on your screen share, go to the GitHub repo so that we end this with where to go for everything. Um, and so people see that as the, like the final thing uh, going off at where they can log an issue, find more information. Yeah. And there we go. So this this is the GitHub repo. Um, oh, and sorry, I muted. That's okay. The GitHub repo and the Google Groups are really, um, if you go to the community page under here, I think there should be one slash community. This is really um, where you can find out how to get a hold of us um, to participate in this. And as I said at the very beginning, this too will change. Um, there will be a little um, probably clean up migration over to, um, and we've done a lot of work getting ready for the CNCF donation and the uh, being incubated by the CNCF. So it, not drastic changes, but you should see some other um, pieces and parts of this pop up in the, in the coming weeks or so. So um, what I wanted to really do is just, Rob, do you have any final words that you want to add to here? Um, um, I'll just say that uh, we're really, really excited about the CNCF news and we're, we're excited to get um, an even stronger community than we already have together um, through that organization. So um, we'd love to hear from you, how you're building operators. Um, like I said, we want certified operators, we want community operators being listed. We just want uh, to make this as big and as powerful as possible um, and meet everybody's needs. So please get involved. Um, Slack, mailing lists, uh, find us at conferences, uh, whatever it is, um, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, that's the other thing. There, we, you know, we will be around, especially um, for the CNCF KubeCon that's coming up in shortly, a few weeks, months, whatever, soon. Um, so, you know, look for us there. We should have a bit of a splash there with the announcement. Um, and we'll all, a lot of us will be online in the chats. Um, for the different, the many operator related um, conversations and talks there. So you can definitely find us there and we're looking for you um, and your participation in this community. So thanks again, everybody for um, joining us today um, and um, we'll be there um, for you and hopefully you'll join us and um, in this adventure. Yeah, thank you everyone.